I'm gonna show you the fastest way to study psychology in college. Hi, I'm Dr. Ali Matu. I was a psychology major at UCLA, went on to get my PhD in clinical psychology at the Catholic University of America, and eventually became an assistant professor at Columbia University. I've taken a lot of psychology classes and I've taught a lot of psychology classes. I know what it takes to be a successful student in psychology. But how much do you know about being a successful student? Let's, let's find out by taking a pop quiz. Which of the following is the least effective study technique? Is it A, reviewing textbooks, notes, and slides? B, testing yourself? C, underlining and highlighting? Or D, creating your own examples of concepts? Do, 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 do. The answer is C, highlighting and underlining. Or did I say underlining, highlighting? I don't remember. It doesn't work at all. And to understand why, I need to explain how memory works. Your mind doesn't work like a computer. It doesn't have separate files for different pieces of information. Your mind is an association machine. It connects things together. If you could see what your memories look like, they wouldn't look like a file cabinet. They would look like a complex spider's web. When it comes to forming new memories, your mind prioritizes information that's very surprising, emotional, or personal. You want the new information you're trying to learn to get caught in the web of your memories. And the way you do that is create a lot of surprising, emotional, personal hooks. I created my own study technique based on this finding from psychological science, and it's the secret behind every single A I earned in psychology. And that system is PEWS, P-E-W-S, Personal Emotional Wild Story. Yes, PEWS, as in pew, pew, pew. In all of my psychology classes, I would take the biggest, most complex foundational ideas and turn them into personal, emotional, wild stories. Take for example, Wilhelm Wundt, the father of experimental psychology. He's the individual who had the first experimental lab in psychology. He used introspection, this way of trying to understand yourself, and he was all about structuralism, trying to understand the structure of the mind. The first thing I do when I'm applying the pews technique, pew, 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 I write down the big idea and then the related ideas I have to learn. So Wilhelm Wundt, as well as Father Experimental Psychology, uh, introspection, and what's the other one? Uh, structuralism. I'm trying to craft a story that weaves together all these things, make it as emotional and wild as possible. Wilhelm Wundt reminds me of Wonder Bread. So I start to imagine this old white guy in a lab coat holding uh, a piece of Wonder Bread and proclaiming to this large um, auditorium, this is the first experiment in psychology. Don't know what that accent was, but it is a very bad accent. Then I imagine that whole auditorium, this whole class full of people, they're all pe eating a piece of Wonder Bread and writing down all the details of the stories. And then I imagine Wilhelm Wundt walking around that classroom and um, putting one hand on uh, a person's mind. And with the other hand, um, he's creating a Lego model of the brain. If you wanna learn more about the real life wild stories of the founding figures of psychology, check out my video on essential psychology books. Let's apply this to biological psychology. Let's say you're trying to learn different parts of the brain and you're trying to memorize what the hippocampus is. This is part of the brain located in the limbic system and it has a role in forming new memories as well as learning information related to some emotions. So how would you apply the Pew's method pew, 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 to hippocampus? I do the first uh, the first thing I do is exactly the same. I write down the word and I write down concepts related to it. Hippocampus, memory formation, emotions, and limbic system. So I'm trying to weave together a personal, emotional, wild story related to it. When I think hippos, I actually think hungry, hungry hippos. This 
game from like the 80s. I wonder if it's still around. Have you played Hungry Hungry Hippos? Is that, is that a game people still play? I don't know. Let me know in the comments below. I imagine all those hippos have entered a memory championship tournament and they end up being the winner. And not only are they like the winner, but they go on to travel the world and show off their amazing skills at, um, at memory. And then eventually they're invited to become these uh, full-time professors in Limbic University where they're teaching about their, um, everything they've learned about memory. And I kind of imagine them wearing those like shoulder patch coats and stuff and like walking around campus and everyone's like oh my gosh it's 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 the hippos the like really really good memory expert people if you want to learn all the different parts of your brain really quickly check out this video i show you uh, one of my favorite techniques to memorize the parts of your brain using your hands as a model, which is awesome because you can bring your hands with you on your test. The next example is one students mess up all the time. Positive reinforcement versus negative reinforcement. A reinforcer is something that increases the chances a behavior will happen again. This is different from punishment, which decreases the chances of a behavior happening again. The part where students get really confused is when we add the terms positive and negative, because you think positive means good and negative means bad. And that's completely wrong, at least when it comes to behavioralism. Positive means something's being added to the situation. Negative means something's being taken away from the situation. So positive reinforcement means you're adding something to the situation, which increases the chances of behavior will happen again. Negative reinforcement means you're taking something away from the situation, which then increases the chances of that behavior happening again. Let's apply the Pew's method pew, 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 to the part everyone messes up positive reinforcement versus negative reinforcement. Start by writing out the term and the related ideas. Positive reinforcement, something that's being added to the situation that increases the chances that that behavior will happen again. And when I think about it, for my life, the example that really comes to mind here is my haircut. For most of the 90s and 2000s, I kept my hair pretty short. I might style it sometimes like Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible 1 and sometimes like Russell Crowe in Gladiator. Maybe I grew it a little bit longer, but not by much. But when 2012 came around, I wanted to change my hairdo. I just graduated from grad school. I had my PhD. I wanted to look more grown up. And I went for something that looked a little bit more like a George Clooney kind of look. And that's kind of the haircut I have right now. And the moment I got that haircut, so many people started to say how they think it looks great. I received so much praise and encouragement. People are like, I love it, it looks so nice. Some people said, I hated your old haircut. This one actually looks good on you. And it felt so good to me. Positive reinforcement. The positive part is not that um, people were saying nice things. The positive part is something that was being added. No one ever talked about my hair before that haircut. What was being added here to the situation is people were adding praise. And the reason why it was reinforcing is that praise felt good to me. As you can see, it's stuck. Like I have never changed my hair. If anything, my quaff has only gotten longer. Let's do one for negative reinforcement. Same process, write it out. Negative reinforcement, we're taking something away that is reinforcing the behavior. And the clear example that comes to me from my own life is back pain. After my daughter was born, I had to carry her a lot because the only place that she would chill out is this shoulder right over here. So I'd be carrying her, there was this one night where she wouldn't stop crying unless she was on my shoulder and I kept her on my shoulder for like four or five hours. And then as she got older, it was about carrying all of her stuff and we were living in New York City. So I was carrying her stroller and her diaper bag and all that other stuff like up and down all these stairs. It gave me a lot of back pain. I was telling my friend about, uh, my friend Bill about all of this and he's had back pain for a very long time. And he said, Ali, have you ever tried a leaf? never had in my life at all. I took one Aleve and 
that back pain was gone. So the behavior of taking an Aleve was negatively reinforcing. Back pain was taken away and that felt really good. It increased the chance that the next time I'm experiencing back pain, I would take a leave. Now you know how to create PO examples. There's a few more things you need to learn to really master the system. And the first is to create a lot of opportunities to remember this information. Every time you remember something, you strengthen that memory. And the reason for that is because every time you think of something, you're actually recreating that memory. The more often you create that memory, the stronger it gets. Think back to the web I mentioned in the beginning. When you activate certain memories over and over again, it strengthens that part of the webbing. It makes that memory much more resilient. So you want to do that a lot. This might come in the form of talking out these examples with friends. I did a lot of studying together. I would create an example, share it with my friend. They would create an example, which would really help because sometimes their examples are better than mine. I would then think of that example. You can also do this in the form of flashcards or using any of the different flashcard apps out there and test yourself on the examples that you come up with. And it might also come up, come up from just creating practice tests yourself that then you have to recreate the Pew's examples in your mind to be able to answer these questions. The more you remember the information, the more you remember the information. It's one of the strongest effects in psychology. It's called the testing effect. So create a lot of opportunities for you to have to recreate these memories. The second thing I wanna recommend is to talk to your professors. Professors are really, really good at creating concrete examples that are linked to concepts in class. So if you're struggling to create a Pew example for your material, go to your professor's office hours. Most of us spend our office hours just doing our own work because people don't show up. That is time for you, for you to get clarification, for you to get answers. So if you're struggling, go to your professor's office hours. Or if you can't make it to their office hours, send them an email. Ask them, hey, I've been struggling with this, actually, don't start an email with, hey, professors hate it when you do that. So write, uh, dear Dr. Matu or dear Professor Matu, I've really been struggling with this concept of reinforcement. Does this example fit the concept? Uh, thank you so much for your help. Also, make sure you don't overthink the Pew's method. Don't spend all your time trying to come up with the perfect example. Just go with what fits. For me, it was often the first thing that came to mind. I could create a story related to that and it was just fine. Let's review the pop quiz from the very beginning. The reason highlighting and underlining doesn't work is it doesn't take into account the way your mind learns new information. There's nothing about it that is surprising, emotional, or personal in any way. There's no effort to combine that information with what already exists in your head. But in these options lie the most effective ways of learning information. Creating your own examples related to your own life and then testing it often. If you can take everything you're learning in your psychology class, apply it to information you already know in a surprising, fun, wild, weird, wacky way, and then test yourself on that over and over again, this information, not only is it gonna get in there, it's likely to stay in there for the long haul. What helps you to learn psychology quickly? Let me know in the comments below. If you wanna learn more about applying the science of learning to your studying, check out The Learning Scientist. They have a lot of great free resources. You're really gonna love their stuff. And if you wanna learn more about being a psychology major and finding success in this field, check out this playlist right over here.